The Sweet Sound of Success show is brought to you by The Mentor Studio. The Mentor Studio is an exclusive mentoring and training program for social influencers, business owners, entrepreneurs, coaches, and startups, bringing personal development to the underserved around the world. And brought to you by Success Strategists, simple strategies that work to develop your business with flow and ease using proven strategies and the right tactics. This is the Sweet Sound of Success with Sue Wilhite, Profit Attraction Master. Sherry Danzig began a wellness journey over 25 years ago when she did a complete career about face from acting as a sales representative in the food industry to becoming a neuromuscular therapist. She founded Wellness Resources International, whose mission is to inspire and teach people around the world about natural and simple solutions for self-care. She has impacted the health and raised the vitality of thousands of people. Sherry's fascination with the mind-body connection has led her to be a student of the science and art of personal empowerment. You can expect to be inspired to take your own empowerment journey. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. I appreciate the honor and privilege of being here with you. Oh, well, bless your heart. Thank you for coming. Um, just the little bit that I learned about you, it's like, oh, cool. She's got a great story. This is going to be fabulous for the show. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know why I got so excited about Sherry's story, uh, this show is subtitled The Hero's Journey for the Entrepreneur's Soul. And as such, I have taken the work of Joseph Campbell and I've just picked out five pieces of that. And we're going to interview Sherry in the, in the context of those five pieces. And those five pieces are the <clears throat> ordinary beginning. No entrepreneur has an ordinary beginning. <laughs> it's 36, 37 episodes. Nobody has an ordinary beginning. Uh, the call to action, what brought her to make that about face that we heard about in the intro. The big hairy monsters, because entrepreneurs deal with big hairy monsters and having to overcome them all the time. Sometimes we get to play with them, but mostly it's overcoming them. And then two pieces that I think are really important for entrepreneurs to really get. And the first one, I think of as just hugely important is the allies, the guides, the mentors, the, the folks who support entrepreneurs in their journey. That there's this whole myth about the entrepreneur slaving away alone in a garage somewhere. And although some of that is sort of true, nobody can get anywhere without other people. Yeah. So that's that's the structure for that. And then finally what Joseph Campbell calls the journey home. And the journey home is how people interact with an entrepreneur now that the entrepreneur has magically transformed into being an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's, it's a transformation that happens when the entrepreneur takes the first bit of money. It's, it's a magical thing. Once somebody pays you for yeah. work you've done, a product you've got, it's magical. It changes you forever. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so other people have it and other people don't necessarily get it. So how did that play out? Because that's a lot of fun. So Sherry, what was your ordinary beginning? <laughs> well, I started out as a school teacher. I was the, the, the daughter with three brothers. So I, I, I really kind of got guided, you know, to a traditional female role. Mm -hmm. So I was a teacher and I loved it and then got burned out pretty quickly. 
Right. Um, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't align up, but then it was like, what am I going to do? So I, I went into the food business, as you heard, and was in the food business for a while. And it was, it was good. Um, it was challenging. I grew up a lot mm-hmm. and it wasn't feeding my soul. So, right. You know, and, and I didn't know that I was needing my soul fed, quite frankly, I really didn't know. Um, well, it, it was, you know, no coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in, in, you know, being guided. And so I was invited to go to a, uh, orientation to a massage school to, a, you know, a class. And I went and I felt I was home. Mm. I felt home. And, and I, so, you know, it was such a complete about face from my job sales meetings to then this very spiritual, very, grounding experience. And I literally came home and told my husband that I was going to quit my job. I was pretty much the sole supporter. He was in graduate school and he was not, he was not entertained by that idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> not at all. There's the so, but I did, I, I kept working and I went to school at night so uh-huh. that that was a process. Right. Right. Um, and then as soon as I could, um, I, I, and then I got, I got pregnant with my first daughter at the same time. So there wasn't much going on in my life. Right. But that was a big part of why I wanted to be an entrepreneur is that I didn't want the life of a working mom that had no freedom, time freedom. Right. I just, I, I, it's like, I knew I wanted to work. I wasn't, we couldn't afford for me to be a stay at home mom. I didn't really want to be a stay-at-home mom completely. It's like, I, I've been, always been one of those who want my cake and I want to eat it. Mm-hmm. So I wanted a career and I wanted flexibility. And so that's how it, it, you know, it came together. I found places I could work to start my business and I quit my job. My daughter was about five months old and I haven't worked for someone since. And she's 31, by the way. Okay. Well, that worked out very nicely. It did. It did. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it definitely was a leap of faith no question right. about it that's the first step right and so the the ordinary beginning and the call to action were sort of all they, they, they were kind of wrapped up in each other they really were yeah what you were doing you were experiencing sort of serial burnout yeah. in, in both yeah. the teaching job and in the in the being in sales rep, sales reps get burned out so yeah. often. It's, yeah. so, it's such a, a yeah. burnout, you know, use them up and move on right. kind, kind of job. Yeah. 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 I wanted something that was, that was truly, um, you know, that supported who I was mm-hmm. and this, and what I knew of myself. Um, and it, you know, when things work, when you're on the right path, it, there's an ease to it. Mm -hmm. So even though being an entrepreneur has its times where you think, gosh, this is just so hard. I mean, cause you know, there's the aspect of uncertainty, you know, I mean, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur because they, if they feel like they have to have that paycheck that they know that they're going to have, then maybe they can be a part-time entrepreneur. Right. Um, so there's, there was that toughness and yet the ability to work for myself and call my own shots and work as hard as I wanted to work and, and therefore, you know, earn, I mean, there was a cap in what I did as a massage therapist, which is what led me to the next entrepreneurial phase of my path, um, which is to go into more of a distribution sales kind of. Um, but a lot of, I brought in my teaching career as an educator. So I feel like everything I had done thus far then transformed into this next field, this next position where I've been a, a global entrepreneur in the wellness field. So I was still practicing as a massage therapist. And, and a few years in, I quit that, although I never really quit it. It never, it never left me. Right. Um, so then I became, it was about teaching, not not just doing, but teaching others to teach others kind of a thing. And I started building a team. And so now I have a business where I distribute wellness technologies all over the world. Literally, we're in about 20 countries. So um, so that became even the next level of being an entrepreneur. 
And I think that's really exciting about being an entrepreneur is that you can continue to reinvent yourself. Yes. Yes. That, that is one of the best parts yeah. is that you don't have some corporate entity in HR that's telling you, well, you can't move laterally or you can't move up or right. you can't change departments or you can't do this, that, and the other thing. And you can't have a raise because it's not in our pay structure. Right. Yeah. You just do. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of, you can't. And right. I tell you what, once you get a taste of, of this, it's very difficult for me. I, I, I would say, you know, I am a, um, uh, you know, I, I forget what I said. I have a, uh, a say, but I'm unemployable. Yeah. I am yeah, truly unemployable. unemployable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they would keep me very long. I think I would say something and question something and they'd be like, uh, the door's right there. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So besides the uh, uncertainty, which really I'd like to bust a myth. Your paycheck is not a guarantee. Oh, for heaven's sakes, yes. Especially these if, days. Especially these days. If anybody has not learned that in 2020, yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah. There's, there's something missing going on. <laughs> right. Because anything can happen and the paycheck could go away. And right. it's not a steady thing. It's not a guarantee. And being flexible. Yeah you know, uh, it, it, it's just a requirement of life, I think. Yeah. And so that's, that's definitely one of the big hairy monsters that, that entrepreneurs get to deal with sure. is, is dealing with that uncertainty and doing, doing what you can to make it as certain as possible. Right. Right. Yes. And I think it's been very much a, my, my own personal process, which has been, is it also the entrepreneur's process is, that you have to learn to become internally directed, not yes. externally directed. Because as you know, when you're you've got a job, the external forces are telling you what to do, how to be, you know, how high to jump, and on and on and on, right? And when it's when you're on your own, even though like like you alluded to, that it's not you know, the successful entrepreneurs don't do it alone. Uh, particularly women, there's been great studies about women that have a mastermind, a mentoring group, you know, some posse that they've created a community are, you know, two or three or four times more successful. Um, they make it because of that support system. Right. You know, and, and so, but it, but it has to be a, your own internal process and I think when we get that as entrepreneurs, we realize that it doesn't matter if we fail, when we fail, because we all fail. We all have things that we do that are a complete bust, right? Right. Um, and when we understand, when we have that internal um, strength within us of knowing what, what's driving us, then it doesn't matter that something failed, something didn't work out. Because we know what we've got inside of us, we simply, you know, retool and and start up again. Yes. With more learning. Right. Right. That's exactly it. You know, it's it's failure. It sounds really trite, and I've had people yell at me about this. Um, I don't know if anybody's yelled at you about this, but failure is a learning opportunity. Absolutely. It's the only time we learn. It's the only time yeah. we learn. I have a talk that the title of the talk is The Art of Falling in Love with Failing. Yeah. Because when we embrace it and we find humor in it, because there, there's always humor in failure if, you, if you're looking for it, <laughs> you know, like not take yourself so seriously, not take what you were doing so seriously and understand that there's so much potential to learn. And, and I mean, that's really what learning is. It's, you know, I, I love the, there's so many different quotes out there. Thomas Edison, I mean, you know, what was it? 10,000 times to get it right. right. Hopefully it doesn't take any of us 10,000 times. Yeah. And he had a team helping him fail. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was yeah. the other thing. He had a team helping him fail. Okay. That yeah. would fail. That would fail. Yeah. That would fail. Yeah. That would fail. Yeah. Oh, great. I have a, 
I have a mantra, I'm failing my way to the top. Yes. Because yes. that's the only way, you know, we, we, we get better from, we go, well, that didn't work. Okay. I just learned that. Right. Right. So yes. it's, it's really, it's, it's reshaping, redefining what failure is. It's a learning opportunity. It is. And, and it's great to be soaring and coasting and, you know, celebrating a win and, you know, where you're flowing. I'm all about the law of attraction and the ease of going downstream, all of that. And, and that's great. And we don't learn anything really at that point. We're enjoying it. So we got to have both, you know. Right. right. Every time, every so often, we're going to hit a snag in the river. And you got to figure out how to maneuver your little canoe or kayak or float <laughs> around that. Yeah. And, and I'll just, I'll kind of interrupt real briefly in here and say there was a study it must have been about 20 years ago now that I remember hearing about it, where they had uh, golden retriever puppies and they would take litters and they would split the litters pretty much in half. Mm -hmm. And they did this with about 20 or 30 dogs uh, on, in either group, either the experimental group or the uh, control group. The experimental group, so all of you animal rights people stand down, it's okay. They didn't allow these puppies to feel any pain. They put covers on their paws. They, they stopped them from, you know, biting each other. Mm -hmm. They made their, you know, containers, whatever they were staying in, completely soft. Right. There was no pain. There was no, nothing. And they raised the other golden retrievers just like you would raise any other dog. They were sure. completely fine. And the ones that never experienced any pain whatsoever were stupid. They couldn't. They, they hadn't learned anything. They hadn't. Well, and they couldn't learn. Right. They literally could not learn any tricks. The other golden retrievers, as soon as they started training them at like eight weeks, the other golden retrievers were like, yeah, I can learn how to sit. I can learn how to lay down. I can make the connection between right. voice and, or right. gestures or what have you. The control, the, the other group, the experimental group, not even. Hmm. So we need yeah. pain in order to yeah. learn. Yeah. Failure in order to learn. It's one of my favorite studies. It's it's just yeah. like, okay, we got to do this. Just It's contrast. We need contrast. We need contrast. We need something for our brains to go after and, mm -hmm. and problem. Right. right. And learn. And I, to learn yeah. Off. And I think that's where we develop a very healthy appreciation. I like appreciation over gratitude. Yes. I like the word. They, they're they similar in what they mean. Um, I think appreciation is more upbeat than gratitude, which is like, oh, thank heavens that didn't happen. A little <laughs> sidebar. So, uh, so I, I appreciation. And I think that we appreciate. Um, that's a wonderful high vibration mindset to be in right is to appreciate and we can't really appreciate if everything was vanilla and the same and all of that so I think you know I, it, it's it makes so much sense cognitively and so one of the ways that I I work with clients is is really getting into the the mindset and how we talk to ourselves because it's easy we all can say oh yeah 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 this makes sense not as easy when we're actually practicing it right because then it brings up an old some old wiring some old memory of when we screwed up and somebody was very critical which goes back to why we need to have mentors and coaches and communities and masterminds so that we can have others helping us to remember that that screwing up doesn't make us a screw up right it, it's it's an event not not a exactly so perfect segue. Thank you, Sherry. Who were some of your allies and mentors and coaches? Well, interestingly enough, very early on in my distribution business practice, I went to a seminar and they had coaches. I'd never had a coach before. Been in therapy, but I'd never had a coach before, right? And so I had my first coach. And honestly, I worked with her for, I don't know, three or four weeks. And I, it, nothing was happening. Because mm -hmm. she was she was a great cheerleader. She was a sweet woman. And she was not pushing me at all. 
Mm-hmm. And so I went back to the person who had started the, who was kind of, you know, the administrator for the coaching program. And I said, this isn't working. This is why. And she said, I got the coach for you. And she hooked me up with, with the guy. And the, I love telling you a story. The first time after I had a coaching session with him, I hung up the phone and burst out crying. And it wasn't a bad thing. It was right. because I was happy about it because he had really pushed me to look at things. So that was about 20 years ago. And he's really a great friend of mine now. So I've coached with him off and on. And, you know, it's good to have somebody that loves you and will call you on your crap. Right. I don't know if I can say that. The the other word. I could say shit. (laughs) So we're okay with the occasional. Okay. Okay. Well, so, you know, it's good to have somebody that that sees the best in you and calls you out on your stuff. So he was, he was definitely uh, has been a great influence for, you know, the last 20 plus years. Um, And I've had other coaches and mentors um, for sure. I I'm at a point in my life now where if someone is, if they're, if they're focused on themselves and their ego uh, more than they are about what they have to teach then, um, you know, if I don't like someone's energy, I simply choose to not spend time with them. And so I've had people that have offered, and I think this is really an important point, is to be really selective of who you let into your inner circle. If they don't push you, that's not good. And if you feel like it's their agenda, that's not good. So I think we have to learn to really trust our gut And we want someone that has that good mix, you know, and I have found over the years that sometimes the people that tick me off, they push my buttons so much. They're the perfect person to work with. Right. Because I don't think people don't bother us. We don't we don't they don't get under our skin unless there's some real truth there and some things that they can help to illuminate for for us. So I think it's, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, There's times where I've been working with more than one person. I have coaches that they say they work with three, four coaches at one time. So you do what you can afford, right? Um, you know, and I think you want somebody that's going to continue growing with you because that is the point. The company that I work with that's uh, as a distribution company is, is based from in Japan they started in Japan and there's a word, a terminology that I'm now seeing it in corporate, you know, other, other settings. It's called Kaizen. Yes. And Kaizen means continual improvement, right? Yep. And that's, we, we can be that and we want to be that. And the return on investment is so there when we are investing on in ourselves so that we can continue growing and improving. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about the journey home. You talked about how your husband was not a fan (laughs) of your early massage career. What were some of the other reactions you've gotten from being in a non-traditional job situation? Non-conformist. I've been a non-conformist my entire life. Um, You know, I've had, I think the people in my inner circle, they may not understand what I do. Um, And so, but you know what, I may not understand what they do either. They may have a corporate job and, and that's okay. You know, I think as long as you have that inner circle of people that do, and so you have relationships. I had, so I have relationships in my life with people that know me very well, personally don't hardly know anything about business so I think it's okay to have these different circles you know yeah. and and I have a mentoring group that I love dearly and um, you know I hardly ever see them but we talk on the phone or we get on zoom once a, once a week and they know every detail of my inner workings of my business and they know some of my personal stuff we don't talk as much about personal right. you know so, so I think it's good to have all of those different support networks, right? Nice. Um, you know, and I think with family, I mean, I work with energy medicine products. I work with magnetic products. I work with things mm-hmm. that are non-traditional in how they support your health. Right. And so I've just, I've gotten very comfortable with, they just simply don't get it. 
you know, it's okay. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, you know, it's about listening. It's about choosing what you're going to listen to. And you can listen to, we all know what the gremlins are. The monkey monkey voices are that are like, rah, 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 rah. and, and in time it's, it takes, it takes time and discipline to practice how you have your own mantra that supports exactly what your vision, what your goals are. And I'm big on, you know, writing them down, saying them out loud, having them plastered all over the place. Right. You now I get messages on my phone, lots of different ways to keep feeding our back to ourselves what we want to hear. And then it, eventually it, it really can drown out all of the noise, the negative noise. Exactly. So I have one more bonus question for you, Sherry. <laughs> um, what is the one thing that you do that if it showed up in your life every day, you would be like, yes. What's the thing that lights you up the most? The thing that lights me up the most from a, um, my own business development is is having someone who is seeking their own transformational journey. You know, I, I, however it is, if it's through the products I work with or from my mentoring programs, when I have someone who is open and looking and seeking and excited and doesn't take themselves too seriously, um, those that that is such a sweet spot for me. I absolutely love being on that journey with people because we all need someone in our corners that can can see us truly who we are and see those possibilities. And I'm where I am today because I've let those kinds of people support me. I've trusted others to to. And what they've what they've seen when I have when I haven't been able to see it, you know. I've had some really dark experiences in my life, and I think most of us have. You know, we've lived enough years that we've had some things, and um, I am incredibly appreciative of the 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 fact that I was able to trust people. So now I I love turning around and and being that that guide that light for others. Nice, beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Sherry, for being on the show. This is everything I hoped for. This is so inspirational and so wonderful and fun uh, to have you here. So thank you for being on the show. And thank you to all of my viewers and listeners on the sweet sound of success. Love it. your dreams for your business. You know what drives me crazy? Really smart business owners denying their talents because they've been taught it has to be hard, because they've been taught that they don't deserve their gifts, that they're not worth anything. They've been taught that their gender means they can't express their genius. I'm Sue Wilhite, and I want you to have access to your genius. I want you to go out and rock the world with your genius. So I created the Call to Action Coaching Program. It's all about getting to the heart 
of you and what you've got to share with the world to make a profitable business that thrives and allows you to make a difference in the world. Click the link to sign up for the Call to Action Coaching Program today. Don't let your genius go unnoticed.